in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 19, we read, it says, then Je- we're talking about Miriam when she became pregnant by the set-apart spirit. It says, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Well, the reason Joseph is called just in this passage is because divorce was more compassionate than stoning. That's why he was considered to be just. But another thing we need to understand here is that divorce does not free a woman to remarry like we consider in modern Western society. Basically, now today, with no-fault divorce and this and that divorce and some other kind of divorce, two believers or not believers or whoever, they just go on down to the courthouse, they get a nullification of the marriage, or they get a no-fault divorce or whatever they do, and they consider that the woman is now permanently free to remarry. And that was never Yahweh's intent. Because we saw earlier in Jeremiah 3 and verse 8 and Jeremiah 3 and verse 14 that even though Yahweh wrote Ephraim, wrote the Lost Ten Tribes a certificate of divorce, they were still married. So the only point is to get her to repent. But if she does remarry, the new marital vow irrevocably separates or severs all of her earlier marital vows. You know, it's just so important that we understand this thing because we can really literally stop Yahweh from hearing our prayers. In Malachi chapter 2 and verse 13, it says that Yahweh's complaining to his bride. He's complaining to Israel. He's saying, and this is the second thing you do. You're messing up, buddy. You're, You're blowing it. This is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of Yahweh with tears, with weeping and crying. So he does not regard the offering anymore. You're bringing sacrifices. You're bringing offerings. He's like, la, 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 I'm not listening to this. Why? Because you're covering my altar with weeping and crying. He said, you, you're, you're causing your women and children to weep and, and, and mourn. So he's not going to regard the offering anymore, nor will he receive it with goodwill from your hands. <laughs> Verse 14, you say, for what reason? Why? Why are you doing this, Yahweh? I brought you a a wonderful calf. I brought you a wonderful goat kid as an offering. Why are you telling me you're not going to accept my offering? It says, because Yahweh has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you've dealt treacherously. I brought you a wife, your first wife. You took a vow. You consummated the vow. You're supposed to stay married to her forever, ever, forever. But you've dealt treacherously with her, even though she's your companion and your wife by covenant. It says, did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? It's because he seeks righteous offspring. In order to have righteous offspring, both the mother and the father have to raise the children up in the way they should go, so that when they are older, they shall not depart from it. Well, no part of that no part of raising your children the way they should go includes getting a divorce from the wife of your youth. He says, therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. Yahweh's going to bring you a bride. You better stay married to her. That's the standard. Teach that to your children. Verse 16, he says, for Yahweh Elohim of Israel says that he hates divorce. For it covers one's garment with violence. Not only does it cover the altar of Yahweh with weeping and tears, but our garments become covered with violence. And why is because it hurts the children in society. They've done study after study. Secular science has verified that the most damaging thing, we take a look at all the wayward youth, we took a look at uh, gang violence, we take a look at the, the prison prisoner studies, the single thing that all the all the youth, troubled youth have in common is the absence of the birth father in the home. This is exactly what Yahweh's talking about. He's saying you've dealt treacherously with the wife of your youth. You've put her away. You've sent her out. It's covering your garment with violence and it's covering my altar with weeping and tears. Bring me your kid goat. You're just muddying my, you're, you're muddying my temple. You're, you're, you're just shedding blood. It's, it's a terrible thing what you're doing. He says, for Yahweh Elohim of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says Yahweh of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously 
which is how he considers if we divorce the wife of our youth. So the thing we see here is that Yahweh's ideal for marriage is that of lifetime monogamy. And I want you to hear me say this, because this is where the study starts to go for a difficult turn here. I want you to hear me say this. Yahweh's ideal for marriage is lifetime monogamy. That means one man, one woman, married together for life. Okay. But once again, because men and women are different, the rules for men and women are going to be different as well. Now, one thing we're going to see, and uh, we'll back this up with scripture, is that in Torah society, although the wife can technically only be married to one man at a time, and if she remarries, it severs the earlier marriage. In Torah society, a man can technically have more than one wife if it was understood at the time of the marriage, at the time the marriage agreement was made, then he can have more than one wife. And if it was not understood, then he is not free to have more than one wife. One for an example, we take a look at Genesis chapter 31 and verse 50. And here we've got Laban talking to Yaakov, or Jacob, also called Israel. So Laban's lecturing Jacob or Israel, and he says, if you afflict my daughters, or if you take other wives besides my daughters, although no man is with us. See, Elohim is witness between me and you. So what he's saying is, you are not free to take any other wives besides my daughters. So the girl's father can limit the, the number of wives that the, the man can take. That's a legitimate thing that he can do. So ladies, if you've been promised that it was going to be a single, one man, one woman marriage, it was going to be monogamous marriage for life, you are well within your rights to insist and assert that. But uh, another thing we're going to see is that if that is not asserted, because men and women are different, Yahweh does allow for what's called polygyny. Now it's commonly called polygamy. That's not technically correct. Technically, the term is polygyny. And in certain cases, Yahweh could even command polygamy or polygyny. But again, it's not his original ideal. In Deuteronomy 25, starting in verse 5, it says, If brothers dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son, then the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family, but her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as a wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. Now, uh, this verse gets misused in a lot of different ways. But what this is really saying here is that you know, you, your, your brother, so you, you are dwelling and your brother is dwelling, your brother dies and he's left his wife. Okay? Don't send her out in the street to go fend for herself. You take her as a wife. You perform the duty of a husband's brother to her and you raise up children for his name. That's what is really being talked about here. So that she has children to love on. So that she has children to support her in her old age. So that your brother's name is able to continue on in Israel. That's what's really being talked about here is duties that are be performed from brother to brother. This is not about taking an unlimited number of wives. That's just, that's not what's being spoken of here. But we need to take a look at some examples. Now, we're going to take a look at some hypothetical examples. Let's just say a Muslim man has four wives. And this is, we've seen cases like this. A Muslim man has more than one wife, or in this case, since he has four wives, and he converts to the faith. Now, what's he supposed to do? Is he supposed to send three of his wives away? Very difficult situation. Now, we know if he's here in America, he can only have one piece of paper, but would it be righteous to send the other three wives away? Or would that be not in fact be unrighteous? If anyone's, you know, think, try to put yourself in the shoes of the three women who would get sent away, get sent out in the street. And I think we can all see that that would, it would not be a righteous thing to do to send the other three wives away. Let's look at hypothetical example number two. A non-believer gets, let's just say, and this, this happens all the time. Let's just say a man in society, he doesn't get married. He gets four women pregnant, just some, you know, an American man. But then he gets saved. Now, he's got four children by four different women. Is he only going to marry 
well, obviously he can only have a piece of paper with one of them, but does he only have a relationship with one of them? What does he do? Doesn't he, if he has four children by four different women, isn't it best that he has a relationship, whether or not there's a piece of paper, but if none of them have remarried, isn't it best that he has a relationship with all four of those women? Hypothetical question number three, and this affects, this, this is an example, this affects a lot of people. I believe a lot of you watching out there are going to fall into this category. Let's just say a believer, so we've got a man and he's a believer, so he gets divorced, let's say, from another believer, and he remarries another believer. But his first wife does not remarry. In other words, she's waiting for him to return to her and restore their children's family. So you're, you're married here, you divorce, she doesn't remarry, so that vow is not separated, and then you remarry. How many wives do you have? Now, you can only have one piece of paper, but in Yahweh's eyes, how many vows have you made? Meaning, how many wives do you have? Okay. Hypothetical question number four, and we can talk about this another time, but if, let's say, all these three prior men get called to ministry, now, and we've seen this happen, we've seen Muslim men get saved, they have more than one wife, and they get called to ministry. Well, to, to minister the truth to their other brothers and sisters in the nations where they live. You know, what are they supposed to do? Now they, do, they, do they send the three wives away? Or do they keep all four wives, but just preach that the ideal is that of one man, one woman together for life? In other words, all of us, we all have spotted past. There's not a one of us who's completely, even if you're a man, and I've met people like this, even if you're a man who got married and you've been married to the same woman your whole life and you've been faithful and true, you've never had, you know, we, we all have something in our lives. We, may, maybe not that, but all of us, we all require his mercy and his favor and his grace at some point for something that we've done. We can't be justified because of our own righteous conduct. It's not possible. But when we come under the blood that's when our relationship begins because Yahweh's called us into relationship with him and now we have a vertical relationship with him and now we also have a horizontal relationship with every other cell in his body. And we have a requirement to treat, I mean, if you can imagine what would happen in a, in a physical body, if, if, if Yeshua's body, if all the cells were fighting with each other, that's what they call autoimmune disease or autoimmune disorder. So, and, and people don't live long when they have autoimmune disorders. And that's, if, as an analogy, that's kind of where the Messianic movement is at right now. Now, just to recap, what we're saying is that in Torah society, Yahweh's standard, Leviticus 20 and verse 10, is that the penalty for adultery is death by stoning. But in Deuteronomy 24, we see that it's an alternative to stoning. It's more compassionate if you send your spouse away. But what's most compassionate still is that you don't even send your spouse away. You don't even write her a certificate of divorce. You just seek after her and love her like Hosea or Hoshea did. Now, you don't have to divorce an adulterous wife. There's nothing that requires it. Deuteronomy 24, properly understood as a judgment, it doesn't require it. But divorce is an option that allows for discipline because a man has to have order in his own home. That's one of those unwritten rules in scripture is that all men hold the other men accountable, but you keep your own house in order. So it's, it's your job to keep your house in order and then we all hold the other men accountable. That's just how it goes. That's how it works. We also see that divorce is not supposed to be permanent. It's not intended like it is in Western society. It's only intended as a corrective measure. Now, when your wife repents, hopefully she repents soon. You take her back. That's what you're supposed to do. Joseph was a righteous man. He was going to divorce his wife, and he says, nope, okay, but he's going he's to keep her next to him. Like Hosea. Hosea went to get his wife back. Yahweh calls to Ephraim and ta says to Ephraim, come back to me. Now, this is the only understanding that explains how you can keep the vow to love, honor, and cherish until death parts you. And we're going to see more about this later. 
But can you imagine this as a marital vow? I mean, if, if people really made vows, like what they're really thinking or what they're really willing to live out today, how about this for a marriage vow? I promise Yahweh that I will love, honor, and cherish in sickness or in health unless I change my mind. Now, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32, it says, But I say to you, Yeshua is talking here. So we know this is infallible. Yeshua is trying to explain Deuteronomy 24 so we can understand it. He says, But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except for sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Now, the reason for this is because if she's committing something sexually immoral, yes, you have to put her away. I mean, she's, she's forcing your hand. You, you, you may have to do something. But if you write her a certificate of divorce and send her out of your house, that's not the end of your marriage. You're still married. So when that other, she goes down to the local bar and that other man comes along and marries her and she says, see, I have a certificate of divorce. I can get remarried. That's not true. That's not true. He's causing her to commit adultery. He's causing her to break a marital covenant vow. And if you as a husband put away your wife when she hasn't committed adultery, you're also causing her to break her marital covenant vow. Because it's not good for men to be alone, but it's really not good for women to be alone. Because men, we're more warriors. You know, we, we, we're, we're okay, more or less, with being alone. It's not good for us, but we can do it. Women are social creatures. Women don't do alone very well. So if you put your wife away and she's got two or three children or whatever she has, she has to get, she needs the support. So if you put her in a jam, this is what they call in a court of law, this is what they call proximate cause. So if you are the proximate cause of her breaking her marital vow, then the blame comes on you. I hope that makes sense, but it doesn't write me. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, we're told that an overseer, so we're talking about leadership. Now, this is an overseer, but we can generalize in this one, whether it's a pastor or an apostle or an evangelist or whoever. But it says, and we'll talk more about that in the fivefold study. It says, an overseer must then be blameless, the husband of one wife. Now, we're talking about a lifetime marriage. We're not talking about serial marriage. We're talking about this is a man, it's one man, one woman, married together for life, and he maintains that relationship. They're going to have problems. Opposites attract, but opposites create friction, too. You're going to have issues in your marriage. You can't be helped. But, but... He, this is the kind of man who knows how to work these kinds of marital issues out. And that's why he's qualified to be an overseer, is he can serve as a good example to the flock. That's why it says, an overseer must then be blameless, the husband of one wife. It's a lifetime marriage, not serial marriage. He has to be temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, and all these other good things. Now, let's take a look at First Corruptions, chapter 3 and verse 2. It says, an overseer must then be blameless, the husband of only one wife at a time. He can swap her out if he wants, but he can only have one piece of paper at any given moment. Is that what it says? Elohim forbid that it should say that. That's not what it says. Now, with that understanding in mind, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 19 and verse 3. Now, this is Yeshua again speaking. So the Pharisees, and this, the, well, we'll talk about that later, but the Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Now, it's important that we understand that the Pharisees basically are the same as the modern-day Orthodox, our brothers and sisters in Orthodox Judah. They just simply changed their name in the Middle Ages. And if we understand that fact, we can understand why a lot of the modern-day legal code is as it is. Okay. Now, back in the first century, you had two main schools of thought. One is you had Beit Hillel and you had Beit Shammai. So, Beit Hillel taught basically easy divorce. And if any of you seen that movie, famous movie, Fiddler on the Roof, when they're all sitting around reading the Talmud, all the, the rabbi and his uh, students, they're all sitting around reading the Talmud together. And the one man remarks, he says, you mean 
I can divorce her just for burning my supper? Because that's what the Talmud says. That's the Beit Hillel school of thought. You can divorce your wife just for burning your dinner. In fact, Rabbi Akiva said you could divorce your wife even if you just didn't like the way she looked. Okay. Well, Beit Shammai, and this was a raging debate back in the first century, back in Yeshua's time, Beit Shammai said the complete opposite. Beit Shammai said that divorce is only justified for very serious infractions of the marital covenant, things like adultery. So, another thing in context, if we take a look at Matthew chapter 14 and verse 3, we see what happened to John the Baptist. It says, For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John or Yohanan had said to him, It's not lawful for you to have her. So John the Baptist is following the Shammai school of thought. King Herod is following the Hillel school of thought. And interestingly, the Pharisees of the Orthodox today still follow Beit Hillel. They still follow the easy divorce school of thought. If you don't like the way she looks, if she burns your dinner, if she talks bad about your relatives, you can divorce her because that qualifies as finding some matter of uncleanness in her. Well, if they would just go back to the root in the Hebrew language and understand the term erva, then they would understand that it has to be sexual immorality. That's what's being spoken of. So again, this comes back to Matthew 19 and verse 3, where the Pharisees, or the Orthodox Jews, also came to him, testing him. They're trying to get him in trouble. See, they got this Yeshua guy upsetting the religious order of the day. They've got a religious establishment. There's a religious spirit kind of a thing going on. So here comes this Yeshka fellow, and he's saying, no, you have to live the right way. And they're saying, whoa, dude, you're messing up the whole scene here. So, wow, let's see, Herod threw John the Baptist in prison, and we got Herod, Herod killed John the Baptist. Maybe we can get the same thing to happen to this Yeshka character. So the Pharisees also came to Yeshua, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? In other words, what do you think about Beit Hillel anyway? What do you think about what happened to John the Baptist anyway? So then Yeshua answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? Therefore they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what Elohim has joined together, let man not separate. It's like they're welded together. You know, when, when, you, when you literally fuse two pieces of metal together, when you, when you melt the metal and join it, it's together. Well, I don't know what they make steel out of, but they melt iron, and, and I think it depends on the kind of steel you're trying to make. But they, they literally melt the components together so that the steel never, ever, ever can come apart. That's the kind of union we're talking about here. The two become one. Not, not just kind of, you know, crazy glued together here, but, but they literally become one flesh. So what Elohim has joined together, let man not separate, ever. So the Pharisees came to him and said, what do you know? They said to him, why then did Moshe command them to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? If it's not okay to write her a certificate of divorce and put her away, then how come he says we can do it? Well, basically the problem with that is people misunderstand what the Torah is. People, you know, the, so there are, and I mean this in all due respect and love, but our, our Pharisee brothers and sisters, pardon me for saying, they just don't get it. So, you know, in scripture it says that a man, I mean, you, you can do all kinds of things in Torah. You can take slaves. Okay, sure, yes, yeah, see, it says right there in the Torah, it says we can take slaves, so let's go get us some slaves. Well, no. If you read Isaiah 58, it's talking about the Day of Atonement. Yahweh is saying, what, is this a fast that I've chosen? You're just going to bow down your head like a bulrush? You're going to go hungry for 24 hours? You, you think that's a fast that I'm going to be pleased with? You, oh, well, we're giving such a light unto the Gentiles, right? Yeah, we're, we're going to go hungry, hungry and thirsty for 24 hours. And this is going to move all the nations to jealousy for Yahweh Elohim. They're going to be so impressed that, that, that this is something that we're, we're going hungry now for 24 hours. 
And th that's really the day of atonement, right? Well, Isaiah 58, Isaiah, Yahweh says, no. He says, this is the fast that I've chosen, that you break off every yoke, that you, that you, you, feed, the, you feed the hungry, that you clothe the poor, that you take care of the widows and orphans in their distress. True and undefiled religion is this, that you, that you take care of the poor and the widows and orphans, and you visit the sick, that you love people, that you, that you show by your actions that you love people. They're not getting, you know, I think if Yeshua was here today, he would give us a bigger rebuke than he gives the Pharisees. I think he would say, you calling your, you've got the gift of my spirit and you're doing what? You're putting your wives away, even though it says very plainly right there, I tell you twice in Matthew 5 and in Matthew 19, I tell you what? And you're still putting away the wife of your youth? The Pharisees come to him and say, what do you know? Why then did Moshe command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? <laughs> he said, are you still so dull of hearing? He said to them, Moshe, because of the hardness of your hearts permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. We don't read about Adam, divor uh, Adam divorcing Hava or Eve. We see the example of Hoshea. He didn't divorce, and Hoshea was before Yeshua's time. We didn't see Hoshea divorcing Gomer. We see Hoshea seeking out Gomer because he loved Gomer, because he loved his wife like he loved his own flesh. He says, you, you, you're, you're, the, you're the teachers of Israel and you don't get this kind of a thing? You're, you're looking at the Torah as a checklist? Check, 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 check. Oh, it says we can have slaves. It says we can have concubines. Oh, it says we can have multiple wives. Oh, we can divorce our wives? Groovy cool. What, what, where's the love? Where is the love in that? And now we have messianic men and women divorcing their wives. Saying, See, it says we can do so in the Torah. Where is the love? If you're supposed to love your wife as yourself, if you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself, are you not counting your wife as your neighbor? She's another cell in the body. You're not counting her as part of the body even? We've got Yeshua's body at war with itself. 